<clears throat> what I want to do for our agenda this evening is to spend an hour in uh, the Apocrypha, spend another hour in the books of Maccabees in the intertestamental period. You know, the intertestamental period lasted for 400 years. So it's good it won't take us 400 years to study everything that's going on. We can do a lot in an hour in summing things up. We'll need our Apocrypha. We'll need our intertestamental period chart as well. It's been a little over a week since we've been looking at this. Uh, I think we had gone up through, I know we had gone up through the life of the first brother, Judas. We're going to be picking up, hopefully, towards the end of the teaching this evening, the second important brother. Jonathan, but before we can do that, we're going to have to kind of backtrack a little. Now, to encourage yourself, why don't you look at your chart and see how much we have done? I said back at the beginning, we've got to go across. There, you've got three bars on here, three black bars, and you've got a lot of historical information that falls underneath each of these. You've got a top one, a middle one, and a lower bar. And I said we're going to have to go from left to right all the way across the material that falls under each of these bars. Starting on this chart, we've had another chart prior to this. We've already finished that one a long time ago. Starting with this one, way back there with one of the Darius kings. This is the top left-hand side of the chart, Darius II. We've gone all the way across from left to right. That bar, moving down to the middle of the page with Ptolemy II, all the way across that bar. And we're way over near uh, 160 is the date where we stopped last time. 160, the end of Judas, the beginning of Jonathan. We're going to pick up with that, and uh, we won't get through with it tonight. It'll probably take a couple of teachings, two teachings maybe, and we'll be all the way over to the far right-hand side. And then all we'll have left is the bottom, so we're a long way through. And because... We stayed so long in Daniel and having to study Daniel chapter 11, and because Daniel chapter 11 has so much to say about the kings of the north and the south, we really got bogged down for many, many weeks on all of these Ptolemies and the kings by the name Antiochus or Seleucus here on this middle bar of the chart. We won't be doing a whole lot of that from this time forth, except where it necessitates a study of it because of some important aspect or connection between the kings of the north and the south and what's going on in Israel. In other words, if you drop down to the left-hand corner, the bottom left-hand corner, you notice how all of those names of kings and queens begin to pile up on top of one another. So you don't have two parallel lines running across there. You've got as many as, what, four or five or six sometimes running across there of a mixture of kings and queens. Let's say around 110 B.C. and then again around 85 B.C. Notice how they're just stacked on top of one another. Uh, for the most part, we're not even going to look at that, except for some comment has to be made uh, because it's connected to John or Alexander, one of those names you see on that, that gray bar that runs across there. So that's going to save us a lot of time, in other words. It's going to save us a lot of time not to have to comment on all of these kings, when they reigned, who they were, and what they did. Even getting up on the middle line to the far right-hand side, Antiochus Eupater, I've mentioned him. We'll mention him again, probably. Demetrius, we've mentioned. Alexander Ballas, Demetrius II, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. We uh, will mention those, but we won't have to spend a whole lot of time there. So you should understand why we've had to spend time. It's because of our studies in Daniel 11. And Daniel 11 minutely went along step by step with these various kings, and we've tried to follow Daniel's leading on that. Now we've got 160 as an ending date last time. But we've hardly said anything about the high priests in Israel. We've mentioned a little about Jason and Menelaus, but we've not made some further marks and comments of distinction concerning some of the things we have here on our chart that uh, may end up being erroneous. 
And I think we've only mentioned Alcimus because we came across him in reading in, first, in the first book of Maccabees, but we don't know much about him because we haven't studied him. We're going to pick up, first of all tonight, in looking at these three high priests, Jason, and then Menelaus, and then Alcimus. Notice your chart says after that, no high priest, in parentheses, and that's true, that's correct. We, that's why we're going to look at these three high priests, because they really bring an end to all of this. Now, if you go over then a little further right, you see Jonathan appointed high priest. Well, it's somewhat similar and somewhat different when you compare him as well as those who come after him with the earlier priest. We know earlier priests like Jason, Menelaus, Alcimus, all three of these have been appointed uh, by Syrian leaders. But we're going to see, we've already seen with two of them, and we'll see with Alcimus more clearly this evening, all three of these have been wicked high priests. They have been high priests with a Hellenistic bent. Jonathan also is going to be appointed high priest, as it were, by the Syrian leaders, but it's more than just an appointment because he also is the political and military leader in Israel. And that's what makes that case unique and interesting, and it, we'll see that with John High Cranist and the rest of the group that come after Jonathan. But that's why you have these notations here on your chart. If I don't make some comment about him, you won't understand why certain things are pointed out. But it's true that we don't have any high priest as such, no high priest at all, from 160 down to around 153 or 152. So that notation is correct, and Jonathan will be the next high priest appointed by the Syrians, and we'll discuss that later on. Whenever they have an arrow drawn on the chart, it's generally because that's not the terminus quo, that's not the end of that person's rule, they don't know when the end was. They just know it carried to at least the point where the tip of the era begins or ends, whichever way you look at it, and somewhere beyond that. But really with Alcimus, you shouldn't have an arrow that points up to 160. You see Alcimus up to 160, and then it just keeps on pointing like we don't know exactly how much further past that he goes. Well, we know he doesn't go any further past that. So there are a few minor things that I would correct, although I probably could never have done this chart. And whenever someone else does something, it's easy to tear it apart and do it better. But when you have to do it on your own, it's pretty difficult. So we'll give the author the benefit of the doubt there. But I would, you know, put a period or put a straight line there for Halcimus. We're going to see tonight that he comes up to 160, and that's the end of him. So don't think in your mind that he goes many years beyond that, how many we don't know. We do know he goes zero years beyond that because he stops there. Okay, so we're going to look at these three high priests, Jason, Menelaus, and Alcimus. You can keep your chart open, and we'll go, we'll go by them, go through them one at a time. Okay, Jason becomes high priest for three years, from 174 to 171, whenever Antiochus Epiphanes, this is Antiochus IV, whenever Antiochus IV comes to the Syrian throne. Jason is the bad brother of Onias III, the good one of the two brothers. Onias III has been one of the important ending high priests. We've had a lot of good ones prior to this time. Many of the Jewish high priests have been good. But we're going to end up on a note of bad luck here, as it were, with Jason, Menelaus, and Alcimus, all three of whom were wicked high priests with a Hellenistic bent. Now, for some reason, the chart shows, and for the life of me, I have not been able to determine why. If you know why or can determine, then you can bless me with some of your knowledge. But why they have Menelaus as a brief, temporary, one year or less, 12 month or less, interruption in the continuous high priesthood of Jason uh, I'll never know. The records that I know, such as what we have in Josephus, what we have here in Maccabees, are just contrary to that. They've got Jason from 174 down to 171. And then Menelaus becomes high priest. 
Uh, they don't tell us how long. They do give us a date, 171. They do correctly note this is the end of the Zadokian high priesthood. They don't tell us are we talking about a full year, all of 171, 12 months or some part of that year. And you see after Menelaus, Jason picks right back up. Since Jason's line, his arrow goes over 170, I would assume we're talking about maybe a month or two or three or four or five or six and maybe no more for the high priesthood of Menelaus. And then somehow something happens to him, he's kicked out, and Jason comes back to the seat of the high priesthood. And what, they've got him going all the way down then to around 163 or, or 162. Where they got that from, I, I, I'm bewildered. I don't have any idea, uh, unless they know something I don't know. But going by the books of Maccabees and Josephus, like we've been doing, which are our best reliable source material for the intertestamental period and for study of the high priesthood, whenever Jason's uh, high priesthood uh, comes to a point of 171, then it comes to an end at that point. And this little interruption of Menelaus stuck in there for nobody knows how many months in 171, and then Jason continuing for uh, the next eight years, I, I think is totally false. So you ought to have the second time Jason's name is mentioned just stricken out. And Menelaus is going to continue in the high priesthood from 171 down to 163 or 162, somewhere there. My chart I've got written in 162, but... 163, I'm sure, is close enough. Let's look at some verses then here in Maccabees to help prove what I'm talking about concerning this, this temporary brief interruption of the high priesthood of Jason by Menelaus. For instance, we're going to put all of these together, if you'll turn with me. For instance, 2 Maccabees 4 and verse 7. We'll have to study this right along here. 2 Maccabees 4 and verse 7. 2 Maccabees 4, 7. But when Seleucus was dead, now when did Seleucus die? Well, you can look on your chart, probably 175, I think is when they'll have him die. When Seleucus was dead and had been succeeded by Antiochus, known as Epiphanes, then Jason, the brother of Onias, Onias III, obtained the high priesthood by corrupt means. Now, you could start him in 175, or you could probably be more correct, as the chart has it. Give us a year for the king to come to his throne in Syria before he starts interfering in the religious affairs of Palestine. 174 would be a good date for the end of the high priesthood of Onias III and the beginning of his younger and more wicked brother, Jason. And that's what you have, 174. So there's no question, assuming we believe this, there's no reason not to believe this account here, there's no question about the fact that Onias ceases being high priest. Now, he's not killed at this time. That's a little bit later. But he ceases to be high priest, and his brother Jason becomes that in 174. Okay, and then verse 23. Three years later, okay, what date would that make it? Well, your chart has it 171. You have to follow all this along. Three years later, Jason sent Menelaus, brother of Simon, mentioned above, to convey money to the king and to carry out his directions about urgent business. But Menelaus established his position with the king by acting as if he were a person of great authority he outbid Jason by 300 talents in silver and so diverted the high priesthood to himself. Okay, no problem with that. No problem with the chart over that. Menelaus becomes high priest three years after the beginning of Jason's rule and that would make it 171. Okay, then chapter 5. Now here's the clincher, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Now, this is old material to us because we've read it before, but we're looking at it for a different reason from a different perspective. <clears throat> okay, about this time, Antiochus undertook his second invasion of Egypt. Now, remember he makes, as far as we know, definitely two invasions of Egypt. You might not remember the dates, but one is in 170, and then he makes his second invasion two years later. That's 168. 
And we've already proven that on an earlier tape, so I won't go into that, but you can have that date marked down for this first verse. When did Antiochus undertake his second invasion of Egypt? In the year 168 B.C. Okay, in other words, we're three years then further down the chart and down the chronological line of history from 171. So by now, according to the chart, we're going to come on Jason being the high priest, right? Go back and look on your chart. We should find Jason as the high priest in 168. Apparitions were seen in the sky over Jerusalem for 40 days, galloping horses, all of this. But on a false report, he's gone down to Egypt to fight, and we know that on both occasions he's not too successful, and particularly on the second one. By a false report of the death of Antiochus, Jason collected no less than a thousand men, and I've got a date out beside this, October 168 B.C., and made a surprise attack on Jerusalem. Now, if he's high priest, I guess he would be living in Jerusalem. The defenders on the wall were driven back, and the city was finally taken, and Menelaus took refuge in the citadel, and Jason continued to massacre his fellow citizens without pity. Now, very clearly, we're not told now who's high priest among the two, but very clearly the implication is if Jason is attacking from the outside inwardly, and Menelaus is already on the inside of the city. Menelaus is in control of the high priesthood at this time. He knew little that success against his own kindred is the greatest of failures. He did not, however, gain control of the government. This is all speaking of Jason now. He gained only dishonor as a result of his plot, returned again as a fugitive to Ammonite territory. Returned again, that means he'd gone there before. That means that must have been the place from which he launched his attack upon Jerusalem to try to, to take the high priesthood away from, obviously, none other but Menelaus. But we're told by the author of 2 Maccabees, his career came to a miserable end, for after being imprisoned by Eretus, the ruler of the Arabs, he fled from city to city, hunted by all, hated by all. In the end, the man who had banished so many from their native land himself died in exile after setting sail for Sparta, where he'd hoped to obtain shelter because of the Spartans' kinship with the Jews, so forth. You look down in verse 15. Not satisfied with this, that is, the king having seen some damage in Jerusalem, the king had the audacity to enter the holiest temple on earth guided by Menelaus. You see, Menelaus keeps popping up here. And we're way after this date on the chart of 171. And then if you look over in chapter 13, now this moves us quite a bit beyond this. Chapter 13 and verse 3. Chapter 13 and verse 3. Menelaus, who? Menelaus also joined them and urged Antiochus on. This he did most disingenuously, not for his country's good, but because he believed he would be maintained in office. And what, you're, you're given a, a date down at the bottom of the page, around 163 or around 162 B.C. here. We can leave it. I think your chart has 163 for the end of Jason's reign. But what are we talking about here? Menelaus believed that he would maintain his office. Now, to me, that just speaks more loudly than does our chart here that there must be a mistake. I don't even have mine corrected. Maybe I better correct mine unless I make a mistake later on. But Jason, as far as I know, should be marked off. The authorities have Menelaus as high priest from 171 down to around 163. Okay, what do we know about this Menelaus? And we've already said a thing or two about Jason because we came across him in 2 Maccabees 4 and verse 7. Well, Josephus tells us, we're on the second of these three high priests, Menelaus now. Josephus tells us that Menelaus was the brother of Onias III, just like Jason. That would make these three brothers, Onias, Jason, and Menelaus. And he tells us that the true name of Menelaus was Onias. But that appears to be a mistake. That would be highly unlikely to have two brothers by the exact same name. You say, well, you could call one the third and one the fourth. 
Well, you don't call brothers third and fourth. It's father, son, grandson, on down the line. Do you start working your numbers down? Not two brothers. You can't have six brothers and call them Onias one through six or something. You've got to have son, grandson, great-grandson, and you know that story. So Josephus evidently is wrong here. This is found in Antiquities, but he does give us a lot of interesting information. Antiquities 12.5.3. Remember the way I told you to write that down? Period, period, period. Antiquities, A-N-T-I, period. 12, period, 5, period, 3, period. Antiquities 12.5.3. Antiquities 15.3.1. This gives you the book and the chapter and the paragraph. And Antiquities 12, or 20, excuse me, 20, 10, 3. Antiquities of the Jews. He was a Jewish historian. Some of what he says appears to be correct. You say, well, how do we determine whether the author of First or Second Maccabees or Josephus is telling the truth? Well, most of the time it's fairly easy to do sometimes it borders on being a difficult circumstance you have to kind of sift through all of the material and just ask yourself what makes the most sense here does it really make sense that onias jason menelaus are all brothers and that menelaus really has the name onias that doesn't really make a lot of sense that their brothers could make sense but since he makes evidently a mistake just a historical mistake about the man's name, maybe he's making a mistake about his whole genealogical background as well. We believe that he is. You're going to find differing opinions on this, and I certainly don't think it'll affect your salvation one way or another, which you believe, but might as well be as correct as possible about it. According to 2 Maccabees, he is the brother of Simon. He's not the brother of Onias or Jason. But he's the brother of Simon, a Benjamite, and an official under Jason. That's Second Maccabees four twenty three. Along with chapter three of that. You have to take that whole third chapter. Chapter three is uh, talking about Heliodorus talking about Seleucus IV and talking about the man who squealed on Onias III for storing up too much treasure in the temple. That man was one wicked. We're told in uh, chapter 3 and verse 4, this wicked man, Simon, he had been appointed an administrator of the temple. And he tells in verse uh, 6 of the alleged treasury at Jerusalem that was full of untold riches. Obviously, he's a wicked man. He's not a God-fearing man, Simon the Benjamite. And he's simply attempting to get Onias III in trouble with the Syrian king, who at that time was Seleucus IV. Then he has a brother, according to uh, the next chapter, chapter 4 and verse 23, whose name is Menelaus. That's where we end up, in other words, with the notation on the chart, end of the Zadokite priesthood. Now, if Menelaus is the brother of Jason, is the brother of Onias III, we couldn't have the end of the Zadokian priesthood, or we would have had that end with Onias III. Because if Menelaus is not from the line of Zadok, then neither is Jason, then neither is Onias III, then neither is Onias II, then neither is Onias I. I mean, you've got to, we've got to go back so far, and we're going to have a same lineage here, a same genealogical tree, a same father, a same forefather here. So that wouldn't make any sense at all. The chart does give us that, and I think the chart gives us that correctly, that what is unique about Menelaus that does not apply to two brothers, Onias and Jason, that come before him, is that with him we have the end of the Zadokian priesthood. So, 2 Maccabees 4.23. Three years later, Jason sent Menelaus. This tells us that Jason is the important one, and Menelaus is simply an official underneath him. Brother of whom? Of Jason? It'd be a prime opportunity to say that. Or brother of Onias? No, brother of Simon. Which one? The one mentioned before or mentioned above. You have to go back to chapter 3 for that. See, every word is important if you're trying to figure something like this out. 
And we know what he does. He, by wicked means, just as Jason, the one under whom he now is an official, by wicked means outbid the brother or now his uh, leader before him to gain the high priesthood. He is last seen in 2 Maccabees 13, verses 3 through 8. We just read part of that, verse 3. We'll go read the whole account. 2 Maccabees 13, 3 through 8, where Lysias, you know who Lysias is now, one of the important generals for the Seleucids, Lysias accuses him before Eupiter. Eupiter is the king after Epiphanes. And he accuses him as being the source or the cause of all Syria's troubles, this wicked high priest Menelaus. And we're going to see his death here. We'll get all that down, then we'll read the passage. And we know the date of this. It's around 163 or 162 B.C. So that can only tell us one thing, if this account is true, that the period for the high priesthood of Menelaus has to extend itself from 171 down to this, this end period. And it's interesting the remark made by Lysias to Antiochus Jupiter about this man Menelaus, that he is the source or the cause of all of Syria's troubles, that must mean he held the high priesthood for this whole time because it would be someone in that position who's a, who's a Hellenist in his mind and in his heart always bringing accusations against Judas and against his brothers and against these true people in Israel, that's what causes all the problems. He's always reporting back, now Judas is doing this and his brothers and their family and the people that are following them are doing these things and send down some more people and send down another general and send down another troop to subdue them. And so Epiphanes would or Jupiter would and they'd be crushed in a crushing defeat there. So we can see how. This man can be the source of all of Syria's troubles. Let's pick up with verse 3 again. Menelaus also joined them. That's Lysias and Jupiter. And urged Antiochus on. And this he did most disingenuously, not for his country's good, but because he believed he would be maintained in office. However, the king of kings aroused the rage of Antiochus against Menelaus. Lysias produced evidence that this criminal was responsible for all of Antiochus' troubles. And so the king ordered him to be taken to Berea and there to be executed in the manner customary at that place. We're told here at, at this place there was a tower some 75 feet high filled with ashes. We'll see what type of ashes here in a moment. It was a circular device sloping down sheer on all sides into the ashes, something like a silo. This is where the citizens take anyone guilty of sacrilege or any other notorious crime and thrust him to his doom. And such was the fate of the lawbreaker Menelaus, who was not even allowed burial, a fate he richly deserved. Many a time he had desecrated the hallowed ashes of the altar fire, and by ashes he met his death. That is, we have the remains of many other people down here. They just wasted away to dust and ashes. And if you remember in our earlier studies of the book of 2 Maccabees, the author oftentimes takes relish in giving us the account of someone's death. God made sure that individual died in a way similar which in, in which he made other people die or that parallels sometimes his wicked life. And we're essentially told that here, that his death was fitting him because it was a proper parallel desecrated the Lord's place time and time again. Okay, that brings us down to probably the middle, around the middle according to the chart, the middle of the reign or the supremacy of Judas among the brothers. And then we pick up with a new high priest that we have said very little about it to this time, Alcimus. And that's his Greek name. He went by several different Hebrew names that I don't guess are important to know. But that's his Greek name. Jason has been a Greek name as well. But Alcimus. Now Alcimus is a descendant of Aaron. 
Menelaus has been a bad priest for many reasons, but maybe the most important of those would be he was not from the Aaronic stock. But Alcimus, correctly, is from the line of Aaron, although he's not in the high priestly line. You understand what I mean by that? You can be a descendant from Aaron, but not a descendant from the right son of Aaron, which means that you were a priest legitimately, but a high priest illegitimately. First Maccabees 7.14. Just a note here, and we'll look at this passage in a little more detail here in just a moment. First Maccabees seven fourteen, a priest of the family of Aaron has come. Now that was something important to Israel, especially to these religious leaders, the Hasidians here, that we finally, after this long reign, about an eight year reign of Menelaus, who was a Benjamite, not a Levite, we finally have a priest that is from the line of Levi. That was important to them. And according to Josephus, that is the same in Antiquities 2010. All of that chapter, chapter 10, book 20, chapter 10. Antiquities 2010. Now, he comes to the high priesthood just a little bit after Demetrius comes to the throne in Syria. Here's what I meant earlier when I said we'll only comment on these kings as we have to because of something going on in Israel. We won't do an exhaustive study of them. If you go back to your chart and trace your way uh, downwardly, you've got Demetrius becoming king in 162. For the continuation of this message, please. If you go back to your chart and trace your way uh, downwardly, you've got Demetrius becoming king in 162. I suppose that's why I have a notation on my chart that maybe 162 is a better date for Alcimus. You see, if we give him 163, isn't that what your chart has? Mine is written over. Then that means he becomes high priest prior to the time that Demetrius comes to the throne. But we're going to see passages here that tell us that's just, it's just the reverse of that. Demetrius comes to the throne first, and then Alcimus becomes high priest very uh, shortly after that. So I would put the date of Alphonse at 162. It has to correspond with Demetrius as 162 or 161. But 162 appears to be correct. Who was Demetrius? Do you remember the connection of Demetrius with all of the earlier figures? Well, he was the son of Seleucus. You have to skip over Jupiter and skip over Epiphanes They've come from Antiochus the Great, remember, back to Seleucus to have Demetrius, who, remember, has been a captive in Rome for many, many, many years. <coughs> Made him wise as it did Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and he'll benefit from that. But he comes to the throne in 162. Now, we're going to look in some detail at the high priesthood of Alcimus because of one thing. <coughs> And that is, the last years of the life of Judas are just totally intertwined and wrapped up with the affairs of Alcimus. As a matter of fact, it seems as though the affairs that Alcimus instigate actually bring about, they are the very things that bring about the death of Judas. We know from our earlier studies, Judas happens to be one of the most important military <coughs> figures in Israel as a nation, as, as a history, as a group of people have ever brought forth. So, in other words, the death of Judas would be something rather significant. Therefore, if that's significant, what initiates his death is significant as well. And that appears to be this wicked, Hellenistically-minded high priest known as Alcimus. The last years of Judas' life, we see that he comes about halfway through, and they're just all wrapped up with Alcimus becoming and remaining high priest. And I want to point this out to you in a series of, of notations here. We'll go one, two, three, four, so it's easy to make note of. To show you the connection between what Alcimus is experiencing as the new high priest and what Judas is experiencing as the soon-to-die Maccabean leader. Okay, in the first place, we're here under Alcimus, our third high priest. In the first place, 
Bacchides and Alcimus are sent to Jerusalem by the new king of Syria, Demetrius. And this is what's going to start the snowball that finally crushes Judas, Maccabeus. Bacchides and Alcimus. Bacchides, the political military leader, Alcimus, the religious leader, are sent from Syria to Jerusalem. This is 1st Maccabees 7 verses 1 through 9. First Maccabees 7 verses 1 through 9. And it will be here that will prove the point I just made earlier that the date of Alcimus as high priest should definitely correspond with Demetrius. You can't have him a year earlier as your chart does. How do we know that? Well, let's look at a few verses here. The year 151, that's according to the Seleucid Reckoning, Demetrius, son of Seleucus, left Rome, landed with a handful of men at a town, proclaims himself king. The soldiers put the former king to death, verse 4, and Demetrius ascends to the throne. So Demetrius is the first of the two, between Demetrius and Alcimus, to come on the scene here. All the godless renegades from Israel led by Alcimus who aspired to be high priest. Now, he's not a high priest yet. That's just what he desires, what he wants. Came to the king and brought charges against their people. They said to him, and who do they first bring up? Judas and his brothers have killed all your supporters, have driven us from our country. Be pleased now to send a man whom you trust to go and see what devastation they have brought upon us upon the king's territory and to punish them and all their supporters. So the king chose Bacchides and verse 9, he sent him and the godless Alcimus on whom he had conferred the high priesthood with orders to take vengeance on Israel. So that's enough right there. He gave him, Demetrius gave the high priesthood to Alcimus, which would prove we're going to have to correspond or parallel their dates. Okay, then secondly, Alcimus is well received in Jerusalem. And it's going to be at the cost of a number of people's lives. He's well received in Jerusalem because he's from the Aaronic stock. And he is especially well received by the religious group known as the Hasidians. This is same chapter uh, around verses 12 through 17, 12 through 17. Now remember, I think it was last week <clears throat> where I told you that uh, earlier, according to chapter 2 of 1 Maccabees, the Hasidians or the Hasidim were the first group of people, evidently the wise ones predicted by Daniel 11, but the first group of people to formally and totally and actually join the Maccabees in the revolt against their Syrian overlords. And what you don't see so clearly back then, but what you do see by the time you get to chapter 7, is that they only had religious goals and religious ambitions. To say it another way, whenever they gained these religious prerogatives that they were after, such as the restoration of the temple and the privilege to worship God again, as, as they chose, they lose interest in the, the technical political revolt against the Syrians because they have no desire to further any political ambitions that might reside in the mind of Judas or other Maccabees such as his brothers. So in other words, they're very quick then to surrender, to give up, to look for some favorable sign from the Syrians. And a favorable sign would be a new high priest that is from the line of Aaron being chosen. That doesn't fit all the qualifications because he's not in the high priestly line, but at least he's in the line of Aaron. To, he's a Levite, in other words, so he legitimately could be some form of a priest. So let's take a look at the verses here. All of this is just building up, snowballing to crush Judas here in the future. Deputation of doctors of the law came before Alcimus and Bacchides asking for justice. They've just arrived in Jerusalem, these two men now. The Hasidians were, in fact, the first group in Israel to make overtures to them. 
first to make overtures to them, and we said earlier, the first to make overtures to the Maccabees earlier in chapter 2. For they said to themselves, now we finally have a priest from the right family, from the right line, Aaron, no longer a Benjamite, as Menelaus was. A priest of the family of Aaron has come with their forces, and he will do us no harm. In other words, they're, they're quite naive. Here comes a high priest appointed by the Syrian leader, and he's coming in company with a Syrian general. And they say, this guy's going to do us no harm. It's a little naive, to say the least. But anyway, I guess people will be people. You get one or two favorable signs. Oh, look, at least he's got the right blood flowing in his veins. Well, that doesn't prove anything if he's got a bad heart, though. The language of Alcimus was conciliatory. He assured them on oath that no harm was intended to them or their friends. But once he had gained their confidence, he arrested 60 of them and put them to death in a single day. And then he quotes the scripture, the bodies of thy saints were scattered and their blood was shed around Jerusalem and there was none to bury them. Although as far as we know, I don't know what passage he has reference to there. And as far as we know, it's not a legitimate use of the Old Testament. Or we'd have another passage that's prophesying the Maccabean period. But I guess in type it could speak of the same thing because we know these people to be people of the Lord, the Hasidians or the Hasidim, and they are slaughtered without mercy here. Then in the third place, once, see they've both been here in Jerusalem, once Bacchides leaves Jerusalem, according to verse 19, then Bacchides left Jerusalem. Then Judas began to see just how bad Alcimus really was. He didn't evidently even know up until this time. Verses 21 through 23. Judas then began to really see how bad Alcimus was. Verses 21 through 23. And then he comes out to fight him. Or to chase him off or do something in verses 24 and 25. Let's take a look at these verses. Alcimus fought hard for his high priesthood. All the troublemakers rallied to him. They gained control over Judea, did terrible damage in Israel. When Judas saw all the mischief which Alcimus and his followers had brought upon the Israelites, far worse than anything the Gentiles had done, then he marched through all the territory of Judea and its environs, punishing deserters and debarring them from access to the country districts. When Alcimus saw that Judas and his band had grown powerful and recognized that he was unable to withstand them, then he returned to the king and accused them of atrocities. So we see now we've got an important boiling point being reached between the political leader in Israel, Judas, and the religious leader, Alcimus. So the next step, or the fourth step in this confrontation, is that the Syrian leader sends forth another general. Bacchides has left Jerusalem, according to 719. He sends forth another general, Nicanor, who is promptly defeated by Judas, verses 26, to the end of the chapter, verse 50. We've looked at this material last week, if you remember. 726 through 50. And we notice the last verse, thus Judea entered upon a short period of peace. They've been very, very successful thus far in their warfare. What's chapter 8 about? Do you remember? You can just look at the first verse and call it to mind. It's all about the Romans. First of all, the great admiration that the Maccabees have for the Romans and then this pact or league they enter into. So that's just kind of a little interlude. You can skip over that and jump down to chapter 9 then. That brings us to our fifth point, the culmination of the death of Judas. Nicanor has been defeated. Bacchides and Alcimus are sent again to Jerusalem. They've been sent back in chapter 7. Now, according to chapter 9 and verse 1, Bacchides and Alcimus are sent for the second time with a twofold purpose, to firmly and finally establish Alcimus as high priest and to kill Judas. 
All of this happens around 160 B.C. Notice verse 1. When Demetrius heard that Nicanor and his forces had fallen in battle, then he sent Bacchides and Alcimus a second time to Judea with the right wing of his army. And you can read then from verse 3 down through verse 22. And you'll see the twofold purpose. One is to establish Alcimus as the new permanent high priest. The second reason is to kill Judas. Okay, let's take the second reason in the first place. Verse 17. The fighting became very heavy and many fell on both sides. Judas himself fell. And the rest of the Jews took to flight. So they're successful in their second purpose here. They're very successful here in their second purpose of killing Judas. What about the first purpose of establishing Alcimus as the permanent high priest? Well, this goes back to what I started saying many moments ago, back to your chart. They give us an arrow to the right of Alcimus, as though his high priesthood should be extended beyond that time. And I said there should be something like a bar, or at least the end of the arrow. Because right immediately after this, the same year, Judas dies. Alcimus has a terrible stroke, and he dies in the same year. So they're successful in the second point, and I guess the most important one, and that is making sure Judas doesn't come out of this battle alive. He's come out of so many thus far alive. They're successful in this point, but they're not successful. And this is another important point in keeping a high priest in Jerusalem who has his apron strings tied to the Syrian government. Now, they're not going to have that any longer. They've had that now for three high priests. That's why we've studied so much about them. Jason, Menelaus, and Alcimus. They've had that for three high priests now for many years. A high priest in Jerusalem, the religious leader of the nation, that had apron strings tied to the Syrian government. This will not be true. Uh, Jonathan will become the high priest next after uh, the elapse of a few years, and he's not nearly so tied to the government in the way he thinks anyway as have the earlier three been. This would be Antiquities 12.9.5 and Antiquities 12.10. Josephus, Antiquities 12.9.5. 12, how many of you have, I just need to know this probably, I'm always talking about Josephus. How many of you have Josephus at home? few people anyway. Something you ought to have is just a reference worth. You're always having to turn to it for some reason, look up something. But you can find all of this, although you might not want to spend a lot of time. Uh, I've read all of, he's got it, I think, uh, Whiston's translation is in four volumes of about 500 pages each. I think I've read, that'd be 2,000 pages. I think I've read about 1800 I don't think I made it through the last 200 pages but I almost got through all of it and it's just a, a ton of material there but he gives antiquities of the Jews he gives a whole history of the Jewish people from creation through Abraham and right down through and in other words he is a Jewish historian uh, commenting historically on so much of the narrative material that you have in the Old Testament it's very very interesting some of the ideas he comes up with some of it's Jewish tradition. Some of it can be proven to be wrong just from reading the Old Testament narrative. Some of it can't be. Some of it is just very interesting as kind of an extra sideline, additional material that can help to throw light on the narrative of the Old Testament that we don't know much about because not much is told to us there. But you'll find it in, in the writings of Flavius Josephus, the important Jewish historian. Okay. Let's, we've got a few more moments. Let's sum up what we have said thus far about these three high priests. That's been our major part of our study here. So far we've seen that all three of the last high priests in Israel have been wicked because they've had the mind of a Gentile. And because we're in this very difficult period predicted by Daniel 11 of the Maccabean era. In other words, it's no surprise to see wicked high priests during this period. Now, no high priest as such exists after that until Jonathan becomes both, quote, king, unquote, and, quote, high priest, unquote. And that will be a 
stigma and a problem we'll have to deal with later on that will continue for a number of years. All of this intrigue, bribery, bidding, corruption, we've seen it with all of these high priests, Jason, Menelaus, Alcimus, all of this intrigue and corruption is very important to know as foundation knowledge for the high priesthood in the New Testament as you open up to Matthew through the book of Acts. It's very important to know. I mean, we know that we're ending up with high priests who are wicked in the Gospels, who are unfair. They don't even give Jesus a fair trial. Now, if that had been back in Old Testament days, we've got many, many good high priests. We've got many good high priests here from Janua down through Onias 1, 2, and 3. We've got very good or basically good high priests during this intertestamental period. But as we work our way through the period, we're halfway through it here, as we, or a little more than halfway, as we work our way through the intertestamental period, uh, the high priesthood goes up for grabs to the highest bidder. We saw that with Jason, Menelaus, and essentially the same corruption and flattery is involved with Alcimus. So I'm just pointing out that this is rather important to know, to have some knowledge of, because it will serve as a foundation, as a background to when we will later study the high priesthood in this class, as a matter of fact, the high priesthood in the New Testament. During the period between the testaments another thing we could say it assumes a very exaggerated and heightened place of political importance and that is what can be so clearly seen in the pages of the new testament particularly matthew through the book of acts matthew mark luke john the gospels in the book of acts why are we saying this? Well, we're saying that if you jump from Malachi over to Matthew, you'll miss the important change in the high priesthood. And you'll wonder, how are we ending up with these guys who are so wicked and so base in the Gospels and whenever Paul is before them, we're ending up with these wicked men. Does it seem like that way for so many of the good high priests in the Old Testament? And not just that, because we do end up with some bad high priest in the Old Testament, but what about these tremendous, tremendous political overtones that we see? Not just religious, but political overtones in the priesthood and in the high priesthood. It's because of all of this heightened, exaggerated importance that is picked up by the high priesthood and by just the priesthood in general in the period between the Testaments. So that will become important to know. Now, with a few more moments that we have, let's drop the subject of the high priesthood, assuming you don't have any questions. And let's complete chapter 9 of 1 Maccabees. And we're through with 2 Maccabees, remember. We're not even looking there anymore. We're just trying to work our way through 1 Maccabees. We've gone through the first third of the chapter, which brings us to the death of Judas. I want to briefly outline, and then we'll close with this tonight, the latter two-thirds of the chapter which introduce us to the leadership of Jonathan. This will carry us seven years from 160 to 153. That little section of time also is noted on your chart. 160 to 153, seven years. Notice that's the whole period during which time there is no high priest. Okay, here's what we have, verses 23 through 27. Things go badly for the Maccabees after the death of Judas because all of the Hellenists take courage, come out of their hiding places, and renew all of this animosity against Israel again. Verses 23 through 27. After the death of Judas, the renegades raised their heads in every part of Israel, and all the evildoers reappeared. Judas had kept them under his thumb, so to speak, for many years now. In those days, also a terrible famine broke out. The country went over to their side. Bacchides chose apostates to be in control of the country. These men set inquiries on foot and tracked down the friends of Judas and brought them before Bacchides, who took vengeance on them, loading them with indignities. It was a time of great affliction for Israel, worse than any since the day when prophets ceased to appear among them. Notice there's one of our prophet 
references there that we've looked at before in canonicity in the books of Maccabees. So we see a reversal of circumstances. Prior to this time, Judas tracked down every renegade and murdered the soul. You know, every renegade Jew and had him executed. Now the renegade Jews come out of their hiding. They take courage after the death of Judas and track down every one of Judas' followers and make an attempt to have him executed. So verses 23 to 27 tell us of the sad state of affairs into which Israel, good Israel, has now fallen because of the death of her leader, her fallen leader, Judas. Then verses 28 through 31, Jonathan, the youngest of the Maccabee brothers, is selected as the new next leader. 28 through 31. And all the friends of Judas assembled and said to Jonathan, Since your brother Judas died, there has not been a man like him to take the lead against our enemies, Bacchides and those of our own nation. Today, therefore, we choose you to succeed him as our ruler and leader and to fight our battles. So Jonathan took over the leadership at that time in the place of his brother Judas. Then verses 32 through 53 we see that for a period of the next seven years, the end of chapter 9 is just going to throw together a large part of time, seven years. For the next seven years, he practices guerrilla warfare against the Syrians, who now have control of Israel and Jerusalem, the city again. It's back and forth, back and forth. That's why they don't have their independence, and they won't get their independence until around 142 B.C. So the Syrians have control of all of Israel and Jerusalem again, interfering with temple worship again. No longer do the Maccabees stand in such an exalted position as they did at an earlier time, and now they have to revert to their guerrilla tactics. That's what you have to do if you're not in the majority or not controlling and enforcing things, and this is what he does, and he becomes rather successful. And you'll find in these verses, which we won't take the time to read, his first encounters with Bacchides, where he is successful. Several encounters between Jonathan and Bacchides. <coughs> this takes us verses 32 through 53. Then in verses 58... And we can see down in 69 as well, Bacchides is finally defeated in one of his encounters with Judas. And you've got scattered battles and various things, uh, verses 54 to 56, uh, interesting work there. We see Alcimus on the scene here. You have to parallel first with 2 Maccabees. So really all the way down to verse 69, from 32 to 69, you see various scattered battles, but particularly 32 through 53 and then 54 down through 69, we see Bacchides is finally defeated. And then in conclusion tonight, verses 70 through 73 are very important. We're going to see a remarkable change in tactics and policies in the leadership of the Maccabees. I'll tell you a little about it, and we'll read those verses, and we'll be through. Uh, earlier, you remember, Judas has basically won his victories because of his courage, his bravery, better soldiers, better tactics, better scouts, better spies, better guides. They fought better battles, and they won the war as a result of that. But it's been because of his bravery and courage. As a matter of fact, he's even praised, remember earlier in verse 21 of this chapter, how is our champion fallen, the savior of Israel, because he was such an important military leader and a very genius military guy. Jonathan now is going to successfully resort to diplomacy, something that the Maccabees have not done, not tolerated prior to this time. You know what diplomacy will get you into? And it's going to do that for the Maccabees. And we're going to enter another sad state for Israel. Although they gain their independence, they gain it at an interesting cost. 
Jonathan now is going to successfully resort to diplomacy, which is finally going to bring an end to the daily constant struggles through which the nation has gone now for a number of years. So let's see verse 70. When Jonathan learned of this, he sent envoys to Bacchides to arrange terms of peace with him and return of the Jewish prisoners. Bacchides agreed and did as Jonathan proposed, swearing to do him no harm for the rest of his life. He sent him back the prisoners he had taken previously from Judea and returned to his own country. Never again did he enter their territory. In other words, we've got a big change right here. So the war came to an end in Israel. Jonathan took up residence in Michmash and began to govern the people, rooting out the godless of Israel. So we could call these verses here, these four verses from 70 to 73, transition verses. They're going to give us a transition from military Maccabees to diplomatic Maccabees. And we're going to see some serious consequences and results of that. We will pick up with the immediate results of that next time and carry it as far as we can with Jonathan's rule. Elkhamus was mentioned there in verse 54, and that's the title of year 159 B.C. Uh, how does that coincide with He's pointing out, uh, that's why I said those verses are some interesting verses there. 54 through 56, the second month of the year, 159, or maybe somewhere around uh, 160, Alcimus gave orders for the wall of the inner court of the temple to be demolished, thereby destroying the work of the prophets. But at that moment when he began demolition, Alcimus had a stroke which put a stop to the activities, paralyzed with his speech impaired, uh, he could not utter a word and give final instructions about his, his property. Uh, remember, I don't know how many times I've pointed this out or when or where I've pointed it out, but remember sometimes the dates down at the bottom of the page are not as precise as they could be. It all depends on what time schedule you're going by. Uh, as a matter of fact, for my reference down there, I have 160 B.C. I've moved most of my dates up a year because I, I count differently than whoever has put these years there. Remember 153, what you'll find in the text is just according to the Greek year, the Seleucid calendar. If you move it up to 160, we don't have a problem. We're back to what we have just said earlier in tonight's teaching that Judas is going to die first, and he does early in this chapter, and then Alcimus is going to die of a stroke later on. And he mentioned, it even mentions a stroke right here, as a matter of fact. Whether this is exactly how it happened, of course, we don't know, but there's no reason to doubt what we have here as to when he's dying, that is, when he's working against the temple right here. You understand what I'm talking about then? Then I think that would correspond correctly with your chart. Assuming that that's right, and it's all, you know, it's still all iffy in too many areas, but I think that would then correspond with your chart. It would get back to 160 for the date of Alcimus, for the date of Judas as well.